Hello, this is Miss Moore, and today during chemistry, we're going to discuss bond polarity. So today's essential question, how is the polarity of a bond determined? And let's start our discussion on bond polarity, talking a bit about covalent bonds or reviewing covalent bonds. So when we're talking about a covalent bond, we're talking a bond that is formed when two atoms share electrons. And each atom donates, donates, kind of, um, one or more electrons to share, and that's what forms our bond. There are two types of covalent bonds. There is nonpolar covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds. So a nonpolar covalent bond is a bond in which the two electrons are shared equally between the two atoms. Whereas a nonpolar covalent bond is a bond in which the electrons are not shared equally between the two atoms. So how does that work? Why do we have um, bonds sometimes where the electrons are shared equally, like a nonpolar bond, and sometimes the electrons are not shared equally, like in a polar covalent bond? Well, that's kind of the point of the lecture. So bond polarity. So a polar bond is, is our bonds that are formed when one atom is stronger than the other atom forming the bond. Remember periodic trends, the power of the nucleus? And also, let's see, electronegativity. So a, a, a effectively strong nucleus um, has a high electronegativity, meaning it pulls the electrons closer to itself. Um, and that's, end up, that's how we end up getting bond polarity. So the degree of polarity, meaning how unequal, I guess, how unequal the sharing is, depends on the electronegativity difference between the two bonding atoms. So the greater the difference in electronegativity between the two atoms, the more polar the bond. Okay, so if we have two atoms that have basically equal electronegativities, then we will have a nonpolar covalent bond. Whereas if um, the electronegativity of one is less than the electronegativity of another, we'll have a polar covalent bond. Um, and the more electronegative one is compared to another, the more polar the bond. All right, so a polar bond will result in what we call a dipole moment or a separation of charge. So let me draw a real sad example here. Let's say we had two different atoms. Um, we've got a strong atom. So this is atom S for strong. And we have a weak atom, which is atom W for weak. Okay. Um, and they want to share those, they're sh going to share those two electrons. Okay, but here's what's going to happen. Our strong atom, the one that's more electronegative, let me redraw this, is going to end up pulling the two shared electrons closer to himself. So they're both sharing the electrons. They do have that, that bond, that covalent bond, but the S, our strong atom, actually has more of the electrons, giving him what we call a partially negative charge. And our W, or weak atom, has a partially 
positive charge. And this is it. Whoops, that's not a positive, Miss Moore. There you go. That's better. Um, the weak atom has a partially positive charge. This is what we call a dipole moment. We've got a somewhat negative charge on this side and a somewhat positive charge on that side. Um, so with a polar bond, the shared electrons will be closer to the more electronegative atom or the atom with the effectively stronger nucleus, um, resulting in a partial negative charge in the region around that atom. Um, the shared electrons will be further from the less electronegative atom, meaning the one with the effectively weaker nucleus, um, resulting in a partial, a partial positive charge in the region around that atom. Um, just to make the drawing a little clearer, in our drawing up above, S represented our strong nucleus and W represented our weak nucleus. Okay, so this periodic table I'm showing you here, you probably noticed that the numbers, all these numbers don't look right. Um, they're obviously not the atomic number or the atomic mass. What these numbers are, are the electronegativity values. Okay, and you will notice the electronegativity for example, fluorine, oxygen, chlorine, the guys in the, the upper right where the electronegativity should be the strongest have really high numbers. Um, this area down here, these are atoms that are gonna have really weak electronegativity and you will note their numbers are really, really low. So um, traditionally, I guess the standard way to figure out whether um, a bond is polar or nonpolar is to use the electronegativity values, do some, look at the difference between them, do some subtraction, and come up with, if there's uh, like a 0.5 difference, zero to 0.5 difference, that would be a nonpolar bond. Um, greater than 0.5 difference would be a polar bond. And then even greater than that, we can end up with an ionic bond. That's all really cool and um, correct. However, you normally don't have these handy dandy electronegativity values available. So we're gonna talk about electronegativity values um, more intuitively. What we're going to say um, is if there is any, sorry, if there is any difference in electronegativity values, um, then the bond is polar. It's possible only a little bit polar, but it will be polar. So um, I guess what I'm gonna ask you to know, if you notice that hydrogen, um, look at his electronegativity values compared to everybody around him. Hydrogen actually lives, if we were looking at electronegativity values, in this area right here, okay? And so for us, um, we're gonna say, I'm gonna scoot this up a little bit, we're gonna say that the only time you're gonna have nonpolar covalent bonds is if you have an atom bonded to itself. So for example, Cl2, O2, obviously Cl, Cl, that's, that's the same electronegativity value, right? O, 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 same electronegativity value. Um, and also CH. Okay, we're gonna see, we're gonna call this nonpolar covalent bonds. Every other bond, we're gonna call polar. Um, possibly only a teeny tiny bit polar, possibly a lot polar, okay? Um, because the truth is, 
unless the electronegativity values are exactly the same, there is going to be some degree of polarity. Okay? All right. So let's try a few practice problems using the information that we now have. So let's say we had a carbon. That's not a very good color. Let's try pink. Okay. So let's say we had a carbon oxygen bond. Um, we're going to say it's polar because they are not the same atom. But let's figure out which one is more electronegative, less electronegative, and where the, where the, um, boy, the, the dipole moments are. So we look at carbon and we look at oxygen. Which one has the effectively stronger nucleus? Well, oxygen does, right? Which means oxygen is going to pull the electrons closer to himself. So what we do is we write a little dipole arrow showing the electrons moving towards the oxygen. We put a little plus sign there. Okay, so that's showing that the oxygen is partially positive. No, it's not, Miss Moore. Try again. The oxygen's partially negative, and the carbon is going to be partially positive. Okay, let's try another one. How about silicon to chlorine? Um, which of those two, silicon or chlorine, is going to be more electronegative? Well, chlorine's going to be more electronegative than silicon, right? So that means the electrons are going to move towards the chlorine with silicon being partially positive and chlorine being partially negative. This is also a polar bond. Now, here's a good question. Which of these two is more polar? Okay, well, let's look at these. We've got carbon. Let's go back to pink. We've got carbon and oxygen. And then we have silicon and sulfur. Because silicon and, why did I say silicon and sulfur? Sorry, silicon and chlorine. Because silicon and chlorine are farther apart from each other, likely the silicon chlorine bond is going to be more polar. Okay, um, that's, that's really it for today on bond polarity. We'll do some practice and then we'll move on to mo molecule polarity. All right, have a good one.